Hello, everybody. Uh, most welcome to this session on partnerships for accelerated action and on NCGD linkages. And uh, my name is Karin Beckstrand. I'm a professor uh, in political science at Stockholm University and also at the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm. And I have the pleasure to moderate this session on an extremely timely theme. It's hosted by Stockholm Environment Institute and Stockholm University and the Institute for Future Studies and also other universities I will come into. And uh, we have an, a very exciting 90 minutes uh, in front of us. We will focus on a crucially important issue, namely how multi-stakeholder partnerships and the SDGs can be vehicles uh, for accelerating implementation of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. And in the light of um, the uh, last summer's SDG summit and the Global Sustainable Development Report, the prospects look rather bleak. There is a large both action and implementation gap so what we will we will focus in this session how can multi-stakeholder partnerships or public private partnerships be used uh, to to how can uh, synergies be addressed and linkages uh, synergies be maximized and conflicts and trade-offs minimized to achieve this and how can we in general between the sdgs achieve greater synergies um, to scale up implementation and uh, so we will focus on this issue that is also uh, crucial as we are heading towards the future for the summit this summer and um, I should say that this side event uh, will present preliminary research funding from numerous projects at Stockholm Environment Institute and at Stockholm University and Myself, uh, I'm leading a project on transformative partnerships that looks, it's halfway through a four year project that looks on the synergies um, um, and effectiveness and also legitimacy of these partnerships. To what extent MSP for SDGs are transparent and accountable. And on that note, uh, I will uh, briefly show our excellent presentations in the next presentation, those who will present in the next slides. So we will have uh, two sessions, uh, one starting with mapping the state of the play of uh, SDGs and multi-stakeholder partnerships in the 2030 agenda. And our first speaker at the Stockholm Environment Institute is Lynn Janberg. She's a research fellow at SEI. And we'll, we will get in, in information on how uh, in the Global Sustainable Development Report these SDGs are um, synergized or not. Uh, secondly, we have in the next presentation in the first session, we have Montserrat Colofon and Cornelia Fast, both PhD candidates at Vrije University in Amsterdam. And they will showcase some very recent research on how multi-stakeholder partnerships can uh, uh, be, um, uh, or uh, actually interlinked or not, and uh, in, in the, uh, a novel data set on this. Uh, then we will have a discussion, uh, hopefully inviting the audience on following these presentations uh, and a, a panel uh, discussion and also involving the audience. Then we will move to the second session featuring two uh, presenters, uh, Dave Prescott, at, uh, he is the creative director at the Partnering Initiative and Dave, David Horan. Uh, at the Stakeholder Forum for Sustainable Future um, and, and also an assistant professor at Trinity College in Dublin. And this, and then we will finally have uh, Magdalena Bexell from uh, Lund University. And this session will be more um, forward-looking, evaluating 
both the effectiveness and the legitimacy and the accountability of the partnerships. Um, and also this session, uh, we will have a question and answer uh, and discussion afterwards. So on this note, I think we should just get into the stuff of SDGs and partnerships. And I should also say that you can post all your uh, questions, comments and reflections in the chat and we will as much as it's possible to accommodate and forward them to the speakers. On that note, um, I'm very happy to leave the floor to our first presenter, Lynn. Thank you very much, Karin, for this uh, introduction. And first of all, I would also uh, on behalf of SEI as one of the co-hosts of this event today, I'd uh, like to extend my very warm welcome to all the participants that are joining us today. I look forward uh, very much to interesting discussions in the coming hour and a half. So to start the session off, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, I would like to share uh, some um, a recent research that reveals global and recurring patterns of SDG interactions, so synergies and trade-offs at global level. Uh, I will also show one practical way forward in how to understand and manage interlinkages by introducing an SEI tool called SDG Synergies. And uh, the context here is that uh, we are now more than halfway through in the lifetime of the SDGs. Um, and as Karin was speaking to as well, we are uh, still in most countries seeing limited progress or even uh, reversed progress in certain areas. So a key question for policymakers, for scientists, for practitioners uh, as to how we, uh, is how we can accelerate progress in the remaining years of the agenda. And one way to do this is to focus on interlinkages. So if we want to address challenges such as biodiversity loss, um, climate change and rising inequalities, this will require balancing between uh, various different environmental, economic and social objectives. And the 2030 Agenda offers a comprehensive framework to think about these challenges in a systematic and integrated way. Um, and even though the SDGs are defined individually as 17 goals, their design is also clearly including many interlinkages. So with this in mind, it's important to identify interventions that can leverage some of the many potential synergies between the SDGs. And it's equally important to be mindful of areas where there are trade-offs or goal conflicts. So taking this systemic perspective on the SDGs with a focus on interlinkages across areas and sectors is one of the keys that can help unlock progress. So firstly, I would like to share some recent research that has been led by my SEI colleague, Tres Benik, and this was published uh, just a few months ago, and it was also included as a background paper to the Global Sustainable Development Report in 2023. And this is the first um, systematic synthesis of how the SDGs interact at global level. Uh, and it's based on a literature review of 51 scientific articles. Um, and the questions that this research has tried to answer is whether there are SDGs that are universally conflicting and creating trade-offs um, across different contexts and countries. And similarly, if there are SDGs that are consistently synergistic, uh, regardless of context. So if we take a look at this figure here um, and focus specifically on the pie charts, we can identify um, goals that have a consistently strong positive influence on other goals. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and this is the case for, oh, sorry, go back to the previous one, please. There, thank you. Uh, so 
this goes so the 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 goals that are recurrently um, generating synergies are related to education, to water, and to partnerships. So these are areas that seem to represent sort of safe investments, if you will, for governments across uh, different contexts. We can also identify SDGs that seem to uh, uh, generate trade-offs uh, consistently, and this goes for the SDGs on zero hunger and agriculture, uh, economic growth, and cities. So these are, are uh, goals that might require particular attention. They're, these negative impacts must be mitigated, or at least priorities must be actively and transparently made. Uh, we also see a few uh, goals that are consistently negatively impacted by progress in other areas. So this goes for the SDGs related to oceans and life on land. Um, and here uh, we believe that this one might be one of the explanations as to why we're seeing particularly poor progress globally on the environmental goals and the environmental dimension of uh, the 2030 agenda. So here, a better integration of the environmental dimension decision making is needed to mitigate the trade offs that are caused by the implementation of socioeconomic SDGs. Uh, and finally, a, a short uh, word of caution here is that we know that the SDG and the SDG interactions are highly context specific. So this type of, of global assessment uh, that I just presented here shouldn't be considered necessarily a truthful picture of any particular context, um, but it can still be useful as a starting point for decision makers also at national and level, not, or at local level and national level that are tasked with SDG implementation, because uh, this um, information is highlighting that there are certain SDGs that are more likely than others to generate synergies and trade-offs, and that might therefore need uh, particular attention. And now we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is taking me to my second part of the presentation. Uh, so the scientific community and other actors have by now developed quite a diversity of, of tools and methods for understanding and managing SDG interactions in practice, including ones that allow for more context specific understandings of interlinkages. And one of SEI's contributions to this collective toolbox is called the SDG Synergies. And this is a method, an online tool that can support decision makers in identifying synergies and trade-offs in a particular context. So we've used this in uh, quite a few different contexts, ranging from the European level, we've looked at the EU, uh, level, uh, regional level, uh, we've looked at national level, for example, uh, as part of the Swedish uh, Voluntary National Review. It's also been used in collaboration with um, municipalities, for example, at local level. We can go to the next slide, please. And uh, an SDG Synergies approach is typically happening in three different steps. Uh, where in the first step we would select the uh, targets that would in be included in the analysis, and this can be either uh, the SDG goals or targets, it can be localized versions of the SDGs, or it can be really any other type of sustainability objective or policy um, objective or activity. Uh, in a second step, we would then assess the interactions across all of the different combinations of targets that we have included in the analysis. You can um, take the next slide, please. Um, and this would typically be done uh, through a participatory process involving uh, cross-sectoral expertise, but it could also be expert-led and desktop-based. And if we go to the next slide, please. Um, this type of matrix shown here is one of the main <clears throat> uh, results and outcomes that we get from this type of analysis. So this uh, gives a quite quick overview of where there are uh, positive and negative interactions in this particular 
contexts. So the blue dots here are representing synergies and the red ones and orange ones are representing trade-offs. Uh, so this type of, of uh, analysis then, if we go to the next slide, uh, can be used to support more co coherent policies and priority setting. So we can answer questions such as uh, which targets have a catalytic effect and where are potential trade-offs? Um, and we can also do a few more sort of sophisticated um, analysis of these results. I'm not going to go into all of those details, but just to give one example, um, we, we have a clustering function where we can ask the tool to, to draw out uh, groups of targets that are particularly closely interlinked in this particular context. And you see an example of this to the bottom right. Um, and this type of information can then be used uh, to identify areas where partnerships or other cross-sectoral collaborations uh, could be particularly important for addressing trade-offs and synergies across different sectors. So this is really my um, segue to the next presentation, which I know will focus specifically on partnerships for addressing interlinkages. Uh, so before I round off, I would just also like to mention that um, with the SDG Synergies tool, we are currently developing a new feature uh, that will allow us to look at transboundary impacts or what's sometimes called geographical spillover effects. So effects that are emerging in one country, for example, but the impacts are happening elsewhere. Um, it would also allow for looking at um, multi-level impacts across local and regional level, for example. So if you're interested in e either of those uh, topics or in general in the tool, or for that matter, um, SEI's research more broadly, you're more than welcome to uh, reach out. We're always um, open for new collaborations. And with that, I say thank you very much and I hand the word back over to you, Karin. Thank you very much I, for that very good overview. Um, and I think we have lots of things for the, the question and answers on this. We want to know more about the synergies and also the conflicts and trades off. Without further ado, I think we should just move over to our next presentation by Montserrat Colofon, Colofon and Cornelia Fast, our multi-stakeholder partnerships addressing the SDG linkages. Please take the floor. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Karin. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Montserrat Colofon, and together with my colleague Cornelia Fast, we will discuss the question of whether multi-stakeholder partnerships seem to be addressing these SDG interlinkages by presenting a little bit of our ongoing research within the FORMAS-funded Transformative Partnerships 2030 project that Karin leads. So if we could go to my first slide, please. Yes, the next one, please. So the departing point of our research is the existence of, let's say, contrasting attitudes and evidence regarding partnerships potential to contribute towards SDG implementation. So on the one hand, and I will start with the pitfalls which are at the bottom, um, research on partnerships has found limited evidence on their effectiveness um, and also some instances of greenwashing or some even talk about rainbow washing, which is like SDG washing. Um, and additionally, there's also some concerns that have been raised regarding the legitimacy and accountability of partnerships, especially in regard to the involvement and influence of private actors. On the other hand, and judging by the global narrative on SDG implementation, some of the promising expectations include, for example, the ability to fill governance gaps through more versatile governance mechanisms, the ability to accelerate implementation by contributing to systemic transformations, and of course, related to that, the ability to bring about uh, synergistic governance, uh, as communicated through the SDG 17 called partnership partnering for the goals. So the importance of the last point is often highlighted in academic publications and flagship reports, such as the Global Sustainable Development Report, also known as GSDR, which was recently mentioned. 
in the previous presentation. And um, as many of you are aware, this report identifies six entry points for transformation. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the GSDR is really only one of several existing frameworks trying to organize or prioritize action to maximize impacts across the SDGs. But in this case, or here, we take it as a good example just to visualize this type of demand for specific SDG interlinkages or SDG nexuses, as they're often called, to uh, enable transformation. So in this case, Zooming into the different entry points, we find that each one of them consists of a group of so-called transformative shifts, which in turn are closely linked to a group of SDGs and specific indicators. And so one of our objectives in this project is to understand the role of partnerships, specifically multi-stakeholder partnerships in transformation, which leads us to ask, next slide please, um, yeah, so it leads us to ask whether partnerships are indeed addressing the SDG interlinkages identified in the large body of recommendations from scientific publications. So my colleague Cornelia will take it from here and briefly explain our approach in answering this question. Yes, thank you, Montserrat. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as a starting point to answer this question that we used raised, uh, we, develop, we developed the Transform 2030 dataset. Um, and as illustrated in, in this image, uh, it departs from the UNDESA's SDG Action Platform, which um, two years ago comprised close to 7,000 entries. Um, and so by looking at those and filtering out the duplicates, identifying those that actually address or seem to address um, two or more SDGs, those that show that they have some type of activity or indicate what their activity is, um, and understanding whether they meet the criteria for uh, transnational multi-stakeholder partnerships, we arrived at a group of close to 400 multi-stakeholder partnerships that we decided to take a closer look at. And so in previous iterations of this presentation, we have kind of presented descriptive statistics showing that only actually a part of those close to 400 are actually active and that they primarily engage with functions such as knowledge dissemination rather than financing and much more. Um, however, today we are focusing on uh, whether this group of multi-stakeholder partnerships are addressing SDG interlinkages and how they are connecting SDGs. So next slide, please. Um, so what we arrived at is that we mapped the MSPs entries on this uh, SDG action platform based on the vocabulary of the SDGs, right? So our aim here was to identify the so-called supply um, of SDG interlinkages or SDG connections that are being made by MSPs. And so this figure might look messy to you at a first glance, however, it's actually quite straightforward. Um, each line in this circle represents how often two SDGs are being connected by MSPs. And so the frequency is kind of indicated by the thickness of the line, um, but I will draw attention to some of the key results, um, so which are highlighted in this in this colored lines. Um, first of all, SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 14 on life below water, as well as SDG 15 on life on land uh, are the most commonly addressed together as a trio. Um, similarly, SDG 13 on climate action um, is also connected to many other SDGs, and that also holds true for SDG 6 on health. Sorry, SDG 3 on health, <laughs> um, that is connected to as many as six other SDGs. Um, on the contrary, some of the goals like SDG 2 on hunger and SDG 5 on gender equality are only connected to one other SDG by these MSPs. Um, and also, um, it's worth pointing out that SDG 12 on responsible uh, consumption and production, as well as SDG 9 on innovation, are the least connected by these MSPs. And so when we start looking at this and matching it towards the findings um, or the suggestions for pathways in the GSDR, but also other research such as, such as Benik et al. Um, we arrive at a set of key messages presented on the next slide. So first, it is worth just re-emphasizing this finding that uh, only a small proportion of the 7,000 or so entries that are showcasing their commitments to the SDGs are actually, being, are actually still active. 
Um, second, when it comes to the connection specifically, um, environmental and social SDGs, notably between climate change and biodiversity and health and education, um, are especially well connected. In contrast, MSPs might may be missing out on addressing important SDGs, such as uh, the one on responsible consumption and production, which you saw in the GSDR uh, entry points also are frequently mentioned or, or indicated. And if we match this, these results to the wider literature, it seems that MSPs current characteristics they hold and the current SDG connections they make may not yet make them fit for purpose in terms of um, tackling the synergistic approach in a holistic way. And so going forward uh, to draw conclusions about the kind of supply uh, or whether the supply matches the demand uh, for prioritization, we need to uh, still look further into kind of the universe of suggestions for how to prioritize. And as Lynn mentioned prior, um, this really includes taking into account the national and local level um, situations that influence what synergies and trade-offs that, that occur. Uh, and so for the Transform 2030 research project, this means that we strive to examine whether the current connections that we see in this uh, circle graph, um, if they actually uh, generate synergies or, tra or trade-offs and how that uh, affects the 2030 agenda at large. And so the next slide, please. Um, just to finish off, I want to thank you for your attention and looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this uh, in the Q&A. And if you'd like to read more about our findings, we encourage you to visit our uh, website or publications, but also to reach out via LinkedIn or email directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn Montserrat and Cornelia, for an excellent overview of the state of play of uh, MSP and the SDGs in general. And it's interesting to observe the, um, or distressing to observe the critical, I mean, gaps in both action and uh, of certain SDGs, such as those on hunger, consumption, agricultural, life of land. So we have seven years to go, and now this is just to kick off, and I should also say a, a general panel discussion. And I also want to encourage, encourage the audience to uh, come up with questions in the chat, any question to the panelists. But I want to kick off with a, actually a first question on, to Cornelia and Montserrat on the last presentation on the role of partnerships and linkages between between them. So we have about seven years to the end of the agenda 2030, and you have these results where you have identified trade-offs and synergies, and but also conflicts. What would you say are the major roadblocks? What role can partnerships play for countries to better address these linkages? And maybe something, if you know from your research, what are the roadblocks? Thank you, Karin, for, for the interesting question to kick this discussion off. Maybe I will give it a go first and connecting to the research that I'm doing within this project, but for my own PhD. So the aspect I'm problematizing there is that many partnerships um, are are working in a fashion that is not fit for purpose. So in in a way, their their task now is to address these systemic problems. Um, however, they don't work with the tools that allow them to correctly visualize and uh, understand um, this type of this type of um, interlinkages, synergies, trade-offs, and conflicts. So this, of course, connects very well with Lynn's presentation because uh, I've been following how you've been developing this uh, uh, SDG synergies tool, and there are a couple other ones. But um, I think vastly practitioners have not yet uh, embraced uh, this type of tools and other existing tools. So there may be a uh, room for room for improvement uh, in that regard. Uh, I don't know if the other two speakers would like to add something. Maybe I will jump in quickly here um, to build on what you said, Montserrat. I think one important, when we talk about roadblocks, uh, from what I see is that there's a tendency to want to reinvent 
the wheel and initiate new partnerships and um, and often not motivated by uh, concrete kind of um, incentives or objectives. They just do it to do it. And I think in that sense, it's important to remember that learning from what's already existing and building up on that can, might be key instead of uh, reinventing the wheel. Um, just as a comment, yeah. Thank you. Um, and Lynn, on your presentation, in a way, it's very promising with this tool that has a possibility to uh, identify uh, these linkages. And what would you say, in light of the synergistic intervention proposed in the Global Sustainable Development Report, we see this uh, patterns of uh, linkages between SDG uh, partnerships. Are there any new areas uh, where you think it's a better prospect for countries to uh, scale up synergies and minimize trade-offs? And, and which are these areas, if you've seen any, and what could facilitate further um, uh, synergetic interventions? Yeah, thank you, Karin, for a very um, interesting and thought provoking question, I think. Uh, so one aspect that I touched upon a little bit also in my presentation is the environmental dimension. Um, as I mentioned, we do see that this is uh, at the global level sort of lagging behind uh, substantially in terms of progress. Uh, so I think that this, I mean, the, the environmental dimension in general should really be more um, integrated in decision making, not only concerning sort of other environmental issues, but but the sort of broader spectrum of sustainability issues that the agenda represents. Um, I think some of the research done on SDG interlinkages so far is also uh, there's also still a limited understanding, I think, of of the role that the environmental uh, SDGs are playing in supporting the other uh, more socioeconomic um, SDGs. So that I think is also an avenue that deserves much more attention. Uh, so how the sort of well-functioning ecosystems are really the foundation for uh, all of the, the social and economic um, objectives. So that would be at least one uh, yeah, message from my end. Thank you so much. I will just just one second because I'm looking into the um, uh, questions from the audience. Um, uh, uh, just a second. Um, 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 okay, I I will read this up as as I see it. It's coming from. Thank you, John Armstrong who says, in my experience, uh, the issue is that the partnerships themselves are not equitable. Not all partners, partners enter such arrangements on equal footing, which means that one partner is usually more powerful than the rest. These thus are not partnerships, but rather vehicles for one party's perspective and priorities. The bigger question is, Partnerships take money, effort, time and patience to be maintained. The partnership itself is not an outcome. So who effectively manages the partnerships as this is essentially thankless and difficult work? I think that's a very good question that concerns power. I mean, I'm a political scientist, so we always ask about power in partnerships and equity. Lynn or Cornelia or Montserrat, who wants to take on this question? I mean, maybe I can offer, I don't know if I have an answer to the question, but maybe I have a perspective on this. Yeah, as I mentioned on, on my introduction, this is, a, this is a criticism or a concern that has been raised uh, for a long time in the literature uh, regarding partnerships, that indeed uh, there's power struggles within the, the partnerships. I just wanted to share that when we were forming the data set that we're using uh, in, for the analysis in our project, we found out that partnerships also 
look extremely different. Uh, we talk about partnerships, but they are, let's say, different creatures <laughs> of different sizes and forms and different types of members, etc. So we do see these instances of one powerful uh, actor bringing together some other, let's say, orbiting actors, but they are the ones uh, who have the main say. Whereas others are much more balanced and um, much more, yeah, in equilibrium, uh, reaching a much, yeah, let's say, a better concept form of consensus within the partnership, or at least it looks like that from from the outside. So I think this is also an aspect that we're trying to cover a little bit in our research, uh, trying to go beyond just like the large end type of research and pierce through and interview. Um, uh, actors and find out how these uh, dynamics work within uh, the partnership because indeed there may be something there in terms of design of a partnership that can also be as extracted as a recommendation of what is a better uh, or worst setup for as a design for the partnership which could lead to success um, or lack thereof. Thank you very much Cornelia. Any other reflections from the panel on this? issue. Otherwise, I, I actually think that the question, we will come back to that because later in, in the second segment, also Magdalena Bexell will talk about the legitimacy and accountability of partnerships. And it's a core, uh, if I, one make a very long story short, 20 years of research of partnerships among many academics have shown these gaps in 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 um, uh, participation in equity in inclusion. So I mean, largely the partnerships in a way mirror the world at large, uh, where uh, there is uh, quest, uh, where there has been very systemic uh, uh, gaps in inclusion from also marginalized stakeholders. So um, I don't see any questions for now on in the um, in the um, uh, chat. So I actually think uh, we will move forward uh, to the next segment uh, on uh, which is actually about how can partnerships be made more synergistic, effective and legitimate. And uh, we have what I, we plan to have three presentation and I'm a bit uncertain if uh, one of the presenters turned up. Is Dave Prescott here? No, he's not. That's very unfortunate, of course. We looked forward to that, but these things happen. But the good thing is that we have two uh, very good presenters. They get a little bit more time on this very crucial topic, how we can accelerate uh, and make partnerships more effective, but also address the critical, which I referred to earlier, or the question referred to earlier, accountability and legitimacy gaps. So on that note, um, our next presenter is um, uh, David Horan. Uh, uh, both, I would say, uh, research, uh, both, of course, an academic, but who's also have uh, experience from the stakeholder forum on the partnership practice and he, uh, David will speak about um, on the importance of uh, having broad based partnerships that could be more collaborative, inclusive and multi-sectoral. Please David share your research insights. We look forward to that. Thanks. Um, thank you very much Karen for the Kind introduction and thank you for uh, Lynn for the invite and for, for organizing this very interesting event. Um, I'd like to compliment the, the speakers for their presentations. Um, I think increasingly participatory tools are an important approach for making progress in this area. And it's it's very useful to have the, the findings from the Transform 2030 project, which I think show us that multi-stakeholder partnerships can account uh, for interlinkages, but there's plenty of untapped uh, potential there to, to, to do better. Um, so I was asked just to speak about uh, research I have done on, on the role of partnerships in enabling an integrated approach. 
and I'll mostly base my uh, presentation on a article that was published in a special issue of Sustainability Science uh, titled um, Trade-offs and Synergies Between SDG Goals and Targets that appeared in uh, 2022. And the link can be found at the end uh, of, of the slides. OK, uh, next slide, please. OK, so what? Um, so I particularly like a recent, uh, there was an article in the IISD uh, Knowledge Hub um, by, from the Stockholm Environment Institute, which uh, calls for a, a need to focus more on the complexity dimension of the SDGs. And I think this is a very important in the next seven years of, of implementation. In a sense, we haven't really looked at the, the potential of the, the 2030 Agenda and the SDG framework as a way to actually deal with complex issues that are uh, increasingly and very much prevalent in, in today's societies. So uh, obviously there's been a lot of focus on the interlinkages and integrated approaches, but there are other dimensions, uh, ways to think about complexity, uh, such as societal complexity, who are the stakeholders to be involved, uh, you know, what is the distribution of responsibilities, uh, concepts around shared responsibilities. So uh, someone who's made uh, a significant contribution on that angle is uh, Rob Van Tulder in his recent book on principles of sustainable business, which could be called principles of sustainable organizations. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to have a look at that uh, uh, when you have a chance. It, basically systematically applies wicked problems analysis to the SDGs. And so just to start my presentation, uh, think about, you know, well, why are we interested in integrated approaches? What's, you know, it's not just the, you know, why, what's the, what's the instrumental value of them? And so I think it's, it's basically a way to transform what often is an unsustainable uh, intervention into one which is less unsustainable. Um, generally, in the area of sustainability, there are no perfect solutions. So uh, any solution you can think of usually generates a range of positive impacts, which we call synergies with the, the SDG framework. And usually there's some trade offs. And Basically, making that uh, intervention more uh, less unsustainable typically evolves requires additional uh, actions of some sort or, or other. Uh, and this is where we have the term transformative actions, which is really about moving beyond siloed approaches or just you know one one action at at a time. So you know, there's lots of examples of this, and we've uh, we as a society, I think, have had to learn this the hard way. If you take uh, take in France with the Yellow Vest movement, uh, the French government implemented a, a fuel tax to try and make progress on its climate commitments. Uh, the impact of that was it had negative spillovers on livelihoods in rural areas. So interlinkage with SDG one. Um, how this came to the attention was through a protest movement, and uh, ultimately the, you know, the tax was not able to be implemented uh, because of this. So that's one example. Um, other ones, uh, you think of expanding renewable energy, typically has some form of negative externality with uh, decent work and uh, regional uh, economies, SDG 8, SDG 9. Uh, in the form of, uh, you know, what we now call just transition, coal miners or coal workers being put out of work. So in all of those cases, you typically require a portfolio of actions, uh, you know, a carbon tax with transfers or a, you know, renewable energy supports with um, uh, some kind of type of retraining for, for the green economy. And uh, usually at the core of it, uh, usually there's some type of partnership is required to, to realize those, those benefits. And I think that's where the, the, the partnerships come into play. Um, so, you know, if you think about um, one example that's often touted as a good intervention, uh, you know, that generates mostly synergies, um, sending girls to school, and that's true, but you need a lot of additional uh, interactions to make that happen, uh, or actions to make that happen. So, you know, things around, you need to look at the linkage with SDG 1, you know, kind of, can the family afford to send the kids to school? 
Um, can they get to school safely? SDG 9, SDG 16. At school, are they sufficiently uh, nourished in order to actually pay attention to what they're trying to learn? Uh, SDG 2. Are, is, are they receiving a quality education, SDG 4, and, and so on. So actually, you know, realising the, the, the benefits can be much more than just the simple siloed action of making it affordable to go to school or, or building uh, extra capacity with, with schools. Um, so next slide, please. So I think one, one, uh, one way to, uh, to try and um, you know, to think about well, what type of partnerships uh, might actually help uh, is to actually start with the issue and the, the linkages. And you know, fortunately, there's been a lot of research done in sustainability science on the um, linkages, mapping out the linkages between a goal across the entire or target across the entire set of SDGs. And this is just one example from the RINI. It summarizes the scientific literature and the, the linkages. So it's a generic, it's not context based, but often these studies, they, you know, what they tell us is there are many uh, linkages across issue areas. Um, the, they also cut across scales and, um, and also the, you know, synergies tend to outweigh the trade offs, uh, et cetera. So I think you know what's the what's the implication for partnerships? Um, we need to consider participation across issue areas uh, and across scales. And this has not been something that uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships have been especially strong at, uh, as as Karen was mentioning uh, earlier. So <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So. <clears throat> So this is where uh, the concept of a broad based partnership comes into place. So it's it, a type of multi stakeholder partnership that is specifically aimed at implementing a goal or target or synergy driver, which is just a, a, a kind of a, a term for for an intervention or a solution uh, in an integrated way. Um, so broad based in the sense that, well, you know, if you're bringing in uh, actors from different issue, issue areas or we saw with the, the, the carbon tax example um, uh, or the fuel tax example, you know, vulnerable groups or the case of um, uh, renewable energy supports, uh, you know, local communities, um, you know, typically there'll be many, many actors who could, you know, perform a variety of uh, roles like help you to identify and assess well how do the actual linkages play out so what are the interactions typically that's very context based they can also uh, suggest solutions so help you to to manage more effectively uh, your your intervention um so at the core of it is a notion of partnership there should be some shared commitment amongst the different actors to actually uh, you know raise synergies and alleviate trade-offs in in some, uh, in a reasonably efficient and, and equitable manner. And, you know, one yardstick for, for judging the success of, of the partnership is to look at, well, what are the actual outputs? Um, you know, do, the, do these outputs support uh, a, an integrated approach? And really it should be a portfolio of transformative actions or, uh, you know, these might be, some of these might be unilateral actions, but, I think in many cases it's you'll find that it's actually there's some type of partnership needed to to actually effectively uh, implement the uh, you know the full portfolio or specific parts of it. Okay, so just a quick note on what the approach to implementation I have in mind here is um, it's you know based on a single entry point. So uh, you know this is this can be a goal target or or, or solution uh, that aligns with siloed approaches that are quite common you know think of sectoral policy making companies pushing a solution uh, etc um and you should consider uh, the the idea is to consider the interlinkages across all of the sdgs the main ones being uh, i focus on first order interconnections but you know not like a nexus approach where you just consider uh, a few goals, maybe SDG two, um, five, and and seven. Uh, but there, you're ignoring the more social goals. So you know that's just privileging the environmental dimension. So you're not really the idea of looking across the entire agenda is to give a more balanced approach to to 
one that balances the three dimensions, basically, and that's the idea of, of indivisibility. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I think I have used up my seven minutes, uh, so I'll I'll try to keep it to to ten or eleven. Um, you can you have some time extra, please develop. Take okay, your time. sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, so basically what the paper does is it outlines a six step procedure for um, uh, for basically building a broad based partnership. Um, so it starts with just briefly to, to describe it starts with the the issue focus. So that's the entry point. And then from there you map out the interlinkages across the entire uh, SDGs. Um, the next step then is to well identify in those interlinked areas who are the stakeholders that have responsibilities there. Um, and then in the fourth step, then try to develop some type of, of monitoring tool that you can assess uh, what the state of progress is in those interlinked areas. And on the basis of that, then you can develop uh, uh, quite concrete recommendations on, you know, which stakeholders you need to bring in and what areas uh, require for integration. So going back to the example of uh, sending girls to school, um, you know, in that case, you would be, uh, you know, the you, you would be thinking of looking at linkages with SDG one um, on poverty, uh, SDG nine on um, uh, transport infrastructure, SDG 16 on peace and security uh, in, in the area, uh, SDG 2 on uh, food and nutrition, SDG 4 on uh, quality education. So if you see there's a problem in, in one of those areas, which, you know, if you use an indicator-based approach and you select a relevant indicator, it should signal uh, to you as the organizer of this type of partnership that there's an issue there and you know you need to be at least collaborating with the stakeholders in that particular issue area to try and find some way of of alleviating this uh, uh, particular problem uh, so the idea behind this framework is that on the one hand uh, you know for practitioners you can use it to try and you know build multi-stakeholder partnerships for integrated implementation and practice and on the other hand for researchers we can use it as a kind of an analytic concept to to assess existing uh, partnerships uh, next slide please okay so the um, um, you know, to speed up the process, we can basically draw on the SDG data dividend, uh, and uh, there's certain types of uh, data that uh, are quite useful. One is there's a lot of mappings of interlinkages out there for, for each of the goals. Um, and it was mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, uh, Stockholm Environment Institute SDG Synergy tool. There's also participatory tools that I think actually might be very useful for this. Um, it's a little bit harder when it comes to responsibilities across SDGs. Um, sometimes, in the case of the Irish government, if you know if you're interested in government departments, it actually specifies the responsibilities uh, across all of the SDGs for each of the departments. So sometimes you have those type of profiles available. Other often you don't. Um, you know, for the UN agencies, a good place to look is the uh, tier assessments. They have good information there. Um, but sometimes, you know, if it's companies, you have to try and think about what their core operations are. So there's sometimes there's, there's sh shortcuts, and other times there's, there's a bit of work to be done there. Uh, in terms of developing a monitoring tool. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work has been done on uh, the SDG indicators. There's data sets available. OK, they might not be up to date. Uh, often we don't have recent data, but and often it's not available at this aggregated level. But, you know, there is much more uh, indicators available now that we can use to at least get a first sense of, of um, how things are going in, in related areas. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, I try, uh, I mean, I wish I could give you transnational multi-stakeholder partnership examples, but uh, I don't have them. But I, I did apply the approach at uh, national level and uh, looked at the issue of coordination across line ministries uh, for implementation. The entry point here is SDG 14. Uh, this is the case of Ireland. And provided you have good data on um, uh, responsibilities, uh, a good sense of the interlinkages across between SDG 14 and the other SDGs. 
and uh, you know good availability of of SDG uh, uh, data for SDG indicators, you can develop quite concrete recommendations on you know who should be in this broad based partnership. So these are the uh, these are the roles basically of this table you see. They're the departments uh, to be engaged in the broad based partnership. They have a first order uh, linkage with the area of SDG 14. And then the entry points in the table are the issue areas that may require integration. Uh, and these are uh, the depth of challenges in those areas is graded using a traffic light system. And you can see I've organized them according to essentially those issues that are you know specific to the have a specific marine focus uh, and those issues that act as pressures that you know progress in those areas could um, uh, it af affect achievement of SDG 14 and those areas where progress on SDG 14 could could affect those. So I'm not using SDG terms here because I'm doing it as a kind of sub goal national level. But uh, the main point is that uh, you know out of 16 government departments that existed in Ireland at that time. Uh, the BPP consists of um, um, uh, nine government departments, and so that was significantly more than than existed. OK, next slide, please. Um, uh, just uh, one. Um, you Can you wrap up? Um, yeah, in a I, minute I was just going to do. Yeah. I saw your message there. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for going on. Yeah. Uh, I'm lecturing too much these days. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know when to stop. Um, OK, so there are certain governance issues, but I think we'll talk a bit more about this in the discussion. So um, uh, that's happy to, to 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 hand it over to you there, Karen. I can come back to those points. Thank you very much, David, and thank you also for giving those concrete example from the governance level uh, on, on the national level, which is very useful. So without further ado, uh, the next presenter is Magdalena, Magdalena Bexell. She's an associate professor at Lund University, and she is a partner in the Transform project. And she will reflect, she has a very deep and wide knowledge on issues concerning legitimacy and accountability of partnerships and in general in governance. So we are very curious to hear what you have to think about these things. Please, Magdalena. Thank you, Karin, uh, and, and thank you for the uh, initiative to organize and put together these different uh, sides of the debate on partnerships in practice and, and in academia uh, too. Um, some of the previous presenters have touched a bit on the governance uh, challenges, so I think that was a very nice uh, bridge from uh, your presentation, uh, David, now. Um, and I'm uh, part of the Transformative Partnerships project where uh, we also address questions of partnership uh, legitimacy and accountability and uh, such governance uh, challenges. Now I was asked to provide overall uh, reflections on these matters, so please go to uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, I only have one slide, so this is uh, where I uh, what I will, uh, the kind of issues I will raise, and I hope we can discuss them uh, jointly with all the uh, participants uh, after, uh, and the audience, of course. Uh, so, um, because multi-stakeholder partnerships exercise uh, power in global governance in different ways, uh, we want to raise questions on legitimacy and authority and accountability uh, too. Now, uh, as we heard uh, in, a, in a prior intervention, there is a broad universe of partnerships, of course. Uh, for instance, as mirrored in the uh, more than 6,000 uh, partnerships registered in the UN Data Platform. Uh, so some are very big and do in fact exercise uh, both agenda setting power and um, power over resources and implementation in, in uh, with regard to the SDGs. Many are very small partnerships and um, quite loosely uh, institutionalized, if at all. Uh, so the level of power varies uh, a lot, to be sure. Uh, now, in research on partnerships uh, legitimacy, uh, we usually think about different sources of potential legitimacy which I think uh, provide a useful uh, point of discussion. 
so one uh, source of partnership legitimacy is the input legitimacy derived from their procedures, inclusive procedures, participatory pr procedures, uh, and the like. Another is their output legitimacy. So to what extent do they actually contribute and, and solve the problems, for instance, implement the uh, SDGs in our case, or contribute to synergies between the SDGs in actual uh, practice and output. We can also consider what uh, we call substantive legitimacy, so that the partnerships derive their legitimacy from the actual goal that they try to obtain, uh, better health, uh, better education, biodiversity and so on. So the, the main source of legitimacy for them would be in the very uh, substantive goal they try to achieve, rather than perhaps in the procedures they use uh, or um, the actual output. And then uh, expert legitimacy is uh, often uh, referenced source of legitimacy for partnerships that by bringing together many different kinds of skills and uh, expertise and resources uh, in this uh, partnering mode, this would offer uh, a source of legitimacy for why partnering as such is a governance uh, tool uh, to be strived for. Now, at the same time, all of these uh, possible sources of legitimacy can also imply legitimacy challenges uh, for partnerships. And the, the more critical literature on partnerships is often um, deri um, derived around the uh, input questions. Um, in global perspective, uh, at least, this is a very big debate, uh, for instance, with uh, tensions between Global North and Global South in terms of who is represented in the global partnership universe, who gets an extra voice through uh, particularly the large uh, partnerships in different issue realms. Um, I think it's uh, important to remember in, in discussing partnership legitimacy and the accountability challenges that arise in relation both to input and output legitimacy challenges, uh, that MSPs have very long accountability change, chains. So the vertical ones uh, I think of are uh, in an ideal setting, uh, what we think of traditionally with regard to representation and accountability. So voters, from voters to governments, from governments to international intergovernmental organizations, from civil society organization, uh, their members to their boards, to the international civil society uh, networks and companies, they have shareholders and boards and uh, executives and so on. So each of these accountability change uh, add up in a partnership in the vertical sense, making these chains very long and accountability very difficult. Horizontally, uh, partners in a partnership um, have some kind of responsibilities and accountability in relation to each other and the partnership goal as such. And this is even more diffuse because this is, as we see uh, in case studies, very rarely institutionalized uh, at all any accountability mechanisms. But um, then the question is, um, where should the main responsibility lie then? Uh, and I think often, both in research and in practice, we find uh, too high expectations on the partnership as such to exercise some form of accountability. Rather, I think more emphasis should be on the members of partnerships. Uh, often the secretariats of partnerships are quite small, weak, uh, their resources are very limited, except for the very large well-known ones. But the large majority of MSPs, they have quite weakly institutionalized um, secretariats and procedures. So. I think in practice we have to uh, put a lot of the spotlight on uh, powerful members of partnerships when it comes to accountability issues uh, and how they relate then to uh, their vertical chains of accountability. So governments, uh, of course, uh, as we see in many 
international organizations uh, who have secretariats on um, running partnerships. There are a few influential governments in many of these IO-led partnerships uh, that set the agenda and offer resources and so on. So I think the accountability debate um, could be focused more on powerful uh, participating members uh, and how they exercise accountability. Now, um, another uh, overarching uh, issue with regard to partnership legitimacy and the kind of uh, debate on, on sources of legitimacy or challenges of legitimacy is in whose eyes partnerships should be considered legitimate then. Uh, I think this raises uh, many good questions on power and um, influence. If we take the perspective of uh, participating uh, member governments, for instance, it's a very different view on legitimacy than if we take the perspective of those who are uh, affected by partnership operations, uh, perhaps very locally in some uh, cases. Um, and here, uh, research doesn't have the ultimate answer, but we have to um, look into who are the key affected stakeholders by partnership operations uh, to see in whose eyes do we think partnerships should be considered legitimate. legitimate. Uh, I think this is something that uh, researchers and practitioners can align around in, in discussing from different perspectives in a very fruitful uh, manner, but also what kind of um, yardstick should we use at all when assessing partnership legitimacy? Uh, should it be a, a very high, ambitious, idealized version of what we could expect? There are very high expectations on partnerships with regard to synergies and implementation and participation. Um, are these uh, at all good uh, ideal yardstick to debate partnerships legitimacy or should, should we somehow uh, specify them and look more into participating members and their the way they exercise power in partnerships. Uh, so these kinds of questions, I think, uh, provide useful ground for reflection. Uh, and um, yeah, it's it's a summary overview, I think, of, of the key tensions in the partnership universe. Thank you so much, Magdalene. I think uh, your presentation, as well as David and the others, show that we really need to discuss this win-win narratives of partnership. Can they, are we expecting too much? Can they accomplish both equity, effectiveness and participation? And this is of course a challenge. So I will now, um, we have uh, here some, um, I will now, uh, we will have a discussion now with uh, Magdalena and David uh, on the theme and then there are some questions in the chat that concerns your presentations, but also others. So we will also move into uh, back to the also uh, previous presenters on some general question trying to uh, sum up. But first on, uh, and I will address the questions, excellent questions in the chat. But first, a question to David on um, actually, <laughs> the roadblocks to partnerships. And uh, I mean, maybe we need to discuss roadblocks more or, or barriers. If, if I would say there are three large, three type of barriers we have. First, it's the zeitgeist, the era. We have the, this poly crisis, the challenge of yeah, multiple intersecting crises, war, energy insecurity, biodiversity, climate, I could go on, uh, and, and, and COVID that for long uh, meant the reversal partnerships. That's one, um, one roadblock. The other is political uh, leadership um, who are hosting these partnerships. They are, as you said, multi-level, but what is the responsibility of government? And thirdly, some have been pointed to 
the economic, the finance, investment. So, I mean, to start with you, David, what do you see, and, and both on national and global level, what are the main uh, barriers here? Are there in, is it mainly political or economic or the era, very polarized era we are in? You need to turn up your microphone. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, on, on mute. Uh, yeah. Um, no, great question. Um, <clears throat> so, and a uh, great presentation, Magdalena, very, very thought provoking. Um, so I, I think uh, actually the, it's even deeper than that, the three you, you highlight. It's, I think we just live in societies that are built on silos and uh, we don't, uh, there's no real capacity there to work across sectors or there's no, there's no infrastructure really there. I mean, the powerful actors are doing it and they bring in the, the, the weaker actors, you know, to rubber stamp things often. But we haven't uh, we haven't mainstreamed uh, you know this this way of 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 working and addressing complex challenges. It's it's new to 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 us. So I, I think the the uh, TPI uh, report on uh, Unite to Ignite, uh, you know, the survey evidence there brings this out quite well. Just you know what the gaps are, um, and and. Yeah, they're pretty extensive, uh, I, I think. Thank you, David. Um, and now to you, Magdalena, and, and thanks for a very thoughtful presentation on the very complex accountability chains of, of partnerships. And you indicated that we need more accountabilities, more, maybe stronger, uh, uh, both um, oversight by international organization, stronger uh, partners that take the lead. And, and on this issue, we know that partnerships, they can be led by business, uh, governments, local authorities, the UN. Do you have any indication for, or in your research, uh, though to, to increase inclusiveness, to increase um, equity is, for example, is it to, is it, for instance, would you and uh, could you and play a more important role in, in brokering this? Do you see this more in UN-led partnerships or partnerships led by strong, um, for example, welfare states, that would be, or is it NGOs who will save us, so to speak? I think with regard to partnerships, the UN has a key role because it has uh, institutionalized channels to make sure that partnerships are not only uh, very short term affairs. Uh, they have the secretariat capacity and, and the capacity to bring together actors. Uh, so uh, I think governments through the UN, uh, but also the UN administrative bodies, uh, they will continue uh, to need to to play a central role in uh, yeah making partnerships uh, not to uh, short uh, term affairs uh, i think it's it's better to have uh, fewer <laughs> partnerships in that sense that they can be more long term and that each partnership has more resources to make something out of the um actual uh, goals that they set so so i would say fewer partnerships but but better institutionalized and more long term would be better now we see a lot of new partnerships being created around summits uh, and um, then as uh, montserrat and cornelia showed then not many of them are actually operational after even one year or two years or so you know much more about that and, and can expand on that but um yeah so i think uh, the un is central thank you magdalena uh, and we will of course continue this research on un partnerships to to see if uh, and i i actually agree that to having a 
kind of stronger orchestration or meta governance of uh, partnerships from UN is is not a maybe sufficient but uh, necessary condition for uh, more effective implementation. So now I will actually go to some uh, question in the um, chat. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to thank the audience. So Janet actually vehemently has a question. Sorry for not pronouncing your name right. To directly to um, uh, Dor uh, David on. Do you have any real examples of BBPs, partnerships who have followed all these steps and currently are operational? That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? That would be wonderful. <laughs> the, uh, no, I don't. It's uh, it's it's just a proposal. Um, it's it's one way for for bringing in the the linkage dimension into the partnerships. Um, but I think I mean. <clears throat> I mean, I see other research now using the linkages as a type of benchmark to 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 set partnerships or collections of partnerships, and um, I think that's that's a good approach. And uh, you know, often it highlights it's you know the partnerships they're not completely siloed, uh, but you know they're they're missing important uh, connections that are relevant in in, in context. Thank you, and. On that note, I also have, uh, and I think this is a very good question on our the research community. We try to grapple, measure linkages. Uh, we use various tools, and there is a question from Eta Latan Pons uh, that actually is directed, and I, I want to call in all the panel participants to to answer here. It says, it seems that all participants have developed their own tools matrix to measure synergies. Is this a duplication of work? And should uh, there be one recognized tool to standardize measurements, such as the tool Lin presented? And how does the SEI address the overlap of measurements? I think this is a very good question. We have also measurements in the UN. So I don't know if you want to take the lead on that, Lynn. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that's a very legitimate question and a good observation. Um, I mean, I think uh, I agree that since 2015, there's been this surge in development of different uh, tools and methods to look at uh, interlinkages, for example, and and at least in the beginning, they were very much sort of developing independently of, of each other. So to some extent, there has de definitely been this uh, duplication uh, of efforts in some cases. Um, but I also see that uh, this uh, diversity of tools that exist now are serving very different purposes. Um, so in some cases, they are uh, highly participatory. In other cases, they're very sort of data driven uh, based on more sort of desktop research. They're, they can uh, deal with issues at the global level only in some cases and at local level in other cases. Um, in some cases, they're only focusing on more sort of scientific assessments. So from for a more scientific audience, in other cases, it's more directed towards policymakers. So I think there is also like this um, pluralism is also a strength, I would say. Um, but having said that, I think that this field has also now uh, reached another level of maturity than it had five or so years ago. So I, I think there is also now more of this um, these efforts of trying to bring um, you know, people together from this community of of researchers and others that develop tools to try and learn from each other and share experiences so that we avoid this um, duplication of efforts. Thank you. Any more thoughts uh, on this, the, the kind of, uh, uh, the I shouldn't say overabundance of the many tools, is it something good or to let thousand blooms blossom or do we need a more steering? 
Um, Karin, maybe uh, I will add something very briefly yeah. because I think Lynn's answer was already great. Um, but indeed, when we started uh, looking into this research of what we're calling supply and demand, right? So supply uh, in the uh, of the side of partnerships, supplying solutions for inter SDG interlinkages, and demand of like, oh, we need these interlinkages the demand of interlinkages for transformation. So uh, when we started there, we, we started by trying to identify the, um, the scientific literature uh, that, we, that is putting out there these demands, right? And there are various frameworks that we find out there, but indeed, as uh, Lynn was uh, saying before, they're not focusing exactly on the same. But this is something that we're currently working on and um, will be hopefully published uh, in, the, in the framework of this, um, of this project. So, and, and there we are trying to also just show a little bit more of an overview of what is the demand actually? What, what, what is the scientific literature saying should be covered? Thank you, uh, Montserrat. Um, we have a question, I, I will, a very thoughtful reflection and question from Malcolm Jun. Uh, I will not read it up, but it basically concerns this um, unequal uh, uh, partners or uh, power disparities of partners. Ex she, he exemplifies from student, when a student organization uh, partners with a corporate organization, the kind of not equal level playing fields that occur. And uh, yes, you can read it. And my take on this is that this is exactly the dilemma we talked about. Um, I mean, in a way, partnerships, if they are bottom up, organic, they grow from the bottom where partners, that's something positive, a kind of as a decentralized. However, uh, that also um, uh, gives less to tap into what Magdalena uh, talked about, possibility to steer and monitor and track and secure inclusion. So this is in a way, so I think part of my answer to that question is in order to, to uh, have more equal partnerships, we need a combination of kind of orchestration convening from the UN and other to have metrics to uh, to ensure uh, equal participation but we cannot take away the self-organized because that's the power of partnerships so there is not a single and uh, not an easy questions on this uh, if anyone else uh, have any reflection on this question please uh, Join. Um, yes, uh, I saw Magdalena first and then David. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah. So briefly, I think um, we will never have a situation where all partners are equal in terms of power and resources and so on. Uh, they bring a, a complementary uh, skills and so on, but precisely because it, it will never happen that that all will be equal in a partnership. It's extremely important to be clear about uh, the purpose of partnering uh, and the contributions that each uh, partner is expected to make uh, at the outset. And I think that uh, many partnerships suffer from kind of vague and lofty uh, goals. Uh, so, so that would be my uh, response. Thank you, Magdalena. David, you had a reflection on this? Yeah, just yeah. to add to that, I mean, I agree. I think clarifying roles and responsibilities is, is key. Um, some of the problems arise because of, of, of vagueness around those. Um, the Yeah, I think this is absolutely essential challenge to, you know, to realizing the transformative potential of, of multi-stakeholder partnerships. So uh, it definitely deserves careful attention. Um, and particularly uh, in the area of, you know, achieving integrated approaches, because, you know, often the, it's the experiential knowledge of, of uh, you know, the 
more local uh, organizations or groups who, 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 you know, they actually have an experience of how these interactions play out and they, they, um, they, they know what type of solutions might work or might not work in their context. So they're absolutely, I think, essential to, to, to realizing this approach. Um, I was at the Academy in Management last August and I heard uh, speaking uh, 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 Barbara Gray, who I think who, who's a specialist on, uh, you know, inequalities in participation. And uh, she, her presentation was very interesting. Uh, she outlined basically we have a lot of background work to do before we run the partnership to ensure that we get uh, equality of, of participation or at least close to it. Uh, so that would be what I would add to the conversation. Thank you, David. And we now we have uh, five minutes left, but I will actually end with a future question that I wanted to pose to the panelists, but that are also posed by John Armstrong. Um, uh, so I will invite each panelist with a final reflection, namely, we know that the narrative around SDGs is increasingly pessimistic in the light of the midterm view where it was very low uh, SDG fulfillment. And the question here has this general, um, also due to the dire state of the world, has this transplanted to partnerships? Has this changed interest and commitment on MSPs? Uh, and so basically, um, I do you think now, as we are heading toward the summit for the future, the summer, and it will be the also discuss the text that the UNEC now in Geneva. Do you think, yeah, is the glass half full or half empty? So I think we end with this very general question, maybe half a minute each. Um, uh, do you want to start, Lynn? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you, Karin. Uh, that's, um, yeah, I, I guess my answer would be, uh, let's focus perhaps on, on specifically on the MSP. I'll leave that for the other speakers. Uh, but I think in general on sort of the issue of interlinkages, I think uh, this whole sort of increased urgency that comes with a, a lack of progress on the SDGs, that's uh, from my perspective at least, it's just making the case even more for uh, taking the a systemic perspective uh, on synergies and trade-offs so that we can really focus the efforts and, and the capacity that we have in a smarter way uh, and prioritize in a smarter way if, um, if um, prioritization is necessary, which it most likely is. Uh, so that would be my message. Thanks. Thank you. Cornelia, do you have any reflection? And after that, Montserrat, given your research pre-summit on these partnerships? Yes, thank you. I think I will uh, add a little note from my research that I'm developing for my PhD, which is focusing mainly on goals and targets and the role of those. And there, what I've seen so far is that uh, over time, there seems to be a consistent trend in what Magdalena mentioned on setting these kind of tall, ambitious, but very vague type of commitments and goals. And I think that's something we will continue seeing, even though the narrative globally is changing from commitment to action, there seems to be a consistency in those commitments. And I think um, what's important now is to kind of figure out what type of effects or steering effects can come from those aspirational goals. Um, and yeah, can we continue setting those? Um, so that will be my, my uh, t key takeaway, I guess, for the future. Yeah. Thank you, Montserrat. Yes, thank you um, for the last reflection prompt. Um, so I guess I don't have, I don't know if any of us has like uh, accurate empirical data on whether this pessimism, pessimism has, let's say, transplanted. Um, we did see, we did observe in several summits that um, on a high political level, the agenda tends to gravitate towards geopolitical concerns and sustainable development uh, is uh, always uh, rather pushed to the bottom. But I guess similar to Lynn's uh, opinion, solutions I think could be much easier and 
much more easier than than we're used to see and more actionable if we were able to uh, effectively identify these so-called um, high leverage points. And uh, the, I think that is, let's say, what at least for me keeps uh, the light of hope on that um, by taking taking this more systemic approach, we're able to uh, actually and effectively uh, accelerate uh, progress in the in the years left uh, of the 2030 agenda. Thanks. Now, David, uh, and then Magdalena. Yeah. One minute, half half a minute each, and then I will wrap it up. What do you think? Half full or half empty? Um, well, I think early signals are a little discouraging, but I don't think we should lose hope. And um, I think we haven't uh, really explored the transformative potential of the agenda and the SDGs. And uh, I think, you know, conversations like these and bringing together uh, different networks and really thinking hard about you know how we can enable these approaches and account for linkages I think is a good a good path forward and something we should try to achieve in the next seven years. Thank you Magdalena you have the last <laughs> word. Yes, I, I, my guess is that um, working towards the 2030 deadline is uh, the is more important to partnership energy uh, than the reviews um, as such. So, so I think the way the the countdown towards 2030 is uh, hopefully something that keep partnerships going at least until then. Thank you. And on this note, I want to round up this, I think, extremely. Um, I learned a lot from this panel and I want to own partnerships and MSP and SDGs and how we can scale them up, integrate, have a more systemic approach to achieve legitimacy and effectiveness. And I want to thank all the presenters and uh, and the audience for very good questions and a particular thanks to SCI for setting up uh, this um, panel and also for Fria University who organizes big thanks to to Maria Cole and Elan Calwell who really the techniques are very important to this. And um, we have also, I should note, recorded this um, uh, side event. So it's there if, if you are curious to, if you missed some presentations. And of course, both at SEI, at, at Stockholm University, Lund University, Institute of Future Studies, Avria University, we will continue with this research. So please follow us on our and I think it's in the invitation on our webpage, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. And we will definitely be back uh, to showcase further research findings uh, as we slowly approach 2030. And uh, yeah, on that note, big thanks uh, to all and uh, hope to see you very soon again. <laughs>